And welcome everybody to another Smart Money Circle show. I'm Adam Sarhan. With me today is Arthur D. Sams, who's the co-founder and president of and CEO at Polar Power. Ticker symbol is P-O-L-A. Since 1979. Arthur, thank you so much for taking the time and coming on the show today. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to tell our story. I always like to ask Arthur, can you tell us a little about yourself and how you got to where you are today, please? Okay. Well, my fascinations from earliest memory have been with biology for pre-med and engineering for inventing. My life's goal is to apply technology to benefit mankind and the environment. And I felt that I always had the talent to pull it off. My partners and I launched Polar in 1979 with a solar powered vaccine refrigerator we developed to support cold chain uh, services in rural and remote areas. Imagine one refrigerator uh, saving hundreds of lives each year. And through this effort, I learned the hard way about the barriers of bringing beneficial and disruptive technology into the market. I learned that it took a larger presence than what we had to launch a beneficial uh, technology. So we applied our skills and knowledge and capabilities uh, pursuing challenging military programs to earn the capital to grow to the stage where it would be uh, easier for us to introduce and managed uh, disruptive technologies. Nice, I love that. So your, chem your biology at the beginning, engineer, you were drawn towards a higher purpose, helping humanity, and you saw that through renewable energy early on. Yes. Did you, did you have other interests in mind or how, like why this, so to speak? Was it clear, did you have clarity in the seventies that this needs to get done or how did you end up with, with this vision? Well, uh, studying a lot of um, biology and engineering and reading all the publications out there and uh, traveling around, uh, it was just quite apparent. Got it. And um, we, it was easy, to, when you study technology, it's easy to, it's easier to predict a future. Yeah. I love that. That is very, very powerful. Okay, beautiful. Can you tell us a little about Polar Power, your business, and some competitive advantages? Okay. Well, the thing that we're doing disruptive is that we're applying uh, DC generators to solar and non-solar applications to reduce the cost of generating electric power while reducing pollution and greenhouse gases. Uh, this will disrupt the use of diesel fuel and AC generators for producing electricity. Uh, our applications are extensive and include the most notable markets of nanogrids, robotics for military, marine, agriculture, telecommunications, uh, electric vehicle charging, and off-grid and bad grid power. Now, what is kind of gives us a competitive advantage is that we're kind of taking a holistic approach of everything. We're taking a look at the solar and how we can make the solar more efficient or another way around is how we can make the power generation without the solar more efficient and uh, be able to offer this in uh, today's market and today's applications, as opposed to pursuing technologies that may be five or 10 years or 20 years out of there, out in the future, where um, you, you can't do anything good today. And I hate to say it, but you're then at the mercy of um, investors for constant funding. We, we have product technologies that we are delivering now. I love that. That is really, really powerful. So from a monetary standpoint and growth going forward, there's obviously a massive market here. The TAM is the total addressable market is, is explosive, not just in the U.S., but all over the world, I'm assuming. What type of growth projections or trajectory do you, or should investors expect going forward? OK, um, with I would say that we have a strong um, projection for growth. Um, mm -hmm the amount of uh, contracts and negotiations that we're in now are, are mind boggling. Love it. We love that. We love growth around here. So uh, next question for you, how do you handle risk 
And what are some mistakes that you see people make with respect to risk management? Okay. Um, I tend to analyze and learn from my mistakes. And um, I keep, uh, when I uh, try to assess something, I try to go beyond the common sense because common sense is not always a reality. <laughs> um, risk to uh, to to um, minimize to mitigate risk is with diversification. Okay, uh, diversification of your product line, of your marketplace, and even diversification of your workforce. Uh, without this diversification, it's easy to have one company uh, crash your future. It's easy to have one market uh, suffer a downturn and crash your market. But when you're when you're looking at multiple markets throughout the world, uh, there's always a good strong sweet spot selling product into somewhere in the world, some application in the world. Got it. No, that makes perfect sense. How about some timeless lessons that you've learned along the way that you'd like to share with the audience? Okay. Um, in terms of um, uh, business, let's... life, anywhere you want to go. Okay. Um, well, let me start off with some of the mentors I've had. Please. And uh, they would uh, essentially shape uh, my uh, business and uh, engineering um, capabilities. Um, my father was my first and foremost mentor, and uh, he was a, a true hardworking scientist at, at different stages of his life. He was a cardiologist, a math professor, a physicist, a mechanic, and driver of battlefield tanks during World War II. Oh, wow. Um, I learned how to explore technology, travel the world, and work hard uh, through his example and through his mentoring. Um, the second, I would say, um, group that's been quite influential have been junior and high school shop teachers. Oh, wow. They gave me the confidence to work with my hands and solve problems in a practical manner. I mean, this aided my engineering studies and helped me produce my inventions. And uh, it was a strong foundation for my engineering skills. I mean, I mean, I was able to design and build things um, at a more advanced stage than engineers 10 years, 15 years, my elder, because wow. of these shop classes. They, they, they teach you that you can't build this, but you can build that. Yes, understood. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. my projects over the decades have attracted the attention of other engineers who lent me their assistance. And through this project process, I had many mentors. And my secret that I learned was to learn on the mentor's terms and not my own. Oh, wow. I love that. That is really, really powerful. <laughs> that is really, really great. So can you give an example of that, please? Okay, well, for example, um, let me give you an example from when um, I try to mentor some of the younger engineers uh, approaching um, or working here at Polar. And what they complain about is, well, you didn't teach me right, or uh, you, didn't, um, you didn't let me understand what you were saying. Uh, you need to do this more and more. And it's almost like saying, well, you know, I'm an engineer, really not an instructor. Right. Wouldn't consider myself a professional mentor, and I wouldn't trust a professional mentor. But um, you have to learn the best way that I can teach. I mean, when I was growing up, um, some of my best mentors would, uh, would shout and scream. I hear you. They would shout and scream because they were excited. Right. They, they were get so involved that they didn't even realize that they were raising their voices. So many times the students or other students would tend to avoid these teachers because they thought they were too abrasive or too hard. But um, I tried to learn on their terms. And um, I also tried to reward them with my success. 
I love that. Yeah, that is really, really powerful. How about the opposite, timeless mistakes? And what have you learned and how do you avoid them? Okay. In terms of timeless mistakes, um, first of all, um, I like to use humor. Please. And um, I mean, I got a pretty good sense of humor and humor eases the stress of business. Um, I make it a point to learn from my mistakes, but I don't consider any of my mistakes as funny. I mean, I would say that the most important lesson that I learned is that common sense is not always a reality. Mm -hmm. What you perceive uh, is the way of the world it may not necessarily be reality. It may not yeah. be the way of the world. I mean, one of the uh, big mistakes that I did, for example, is doing government contracting. I read a lot of books. I attended a lot of lectures and presentations by the various buying commands. And with that, I had to shape, I had an idea of what opportunities I had. It was unfortunately until many years later that I I saw clearly that it was not a reality. Understood. There was limitations on the contracts that we could go uh, after, despite the recruiting efforts uh, to participate in these contracts. So there's nothing beats experience. You can read every book in the world, but nothing beats experience. Yeah, I love that. That is great. So you've been a leader now, Arthur, for 45, 44, 45 years with yeah. Polar. What, what makes a great leader? And what are some lessons you've learned about leadership that you'd like to share with the audience? In terms of leadership, um, it's being able to understand that there's two sides to an argument. There's two sides to a story. Um, there's usually a reason why a person um, is behaving or acting a certain way. And then at times, you have to learn that sometimes you can be too lenient. Mm -hmm. And um, it's always a balance between being lenient and um, being not so lenient. Makes perfect sense. How about some obstacles? that you've had to overcome and or adversity? Would you like to speak about any of those, please? Um, yeah, I would say diversity. Uh, ad adversity is, um, I would say, probably the, the biggest adversity that probably people run across is being different than the group. Mm. Uh, if you're going to be a leader, you have to be slightly different, which then separates you from the group. But at the same time, you want to be part of the group. Right. That's, so that's it's, being to, to, it's being able to balance that. And uh, I would say that my upbringing has been kind of different than um, most of my peers. Uh, they had not had the freedoms I had mm -hmm. and being able to do the things that you wanted to do. And then two, uh, some of the diversity growing up was either you run into issues of color, race, religion, you mm -hmm. know, like that. Yep. So, yeah. That makes uh, perfect sense. Mm -hmm. And then how about obstacles? How do you overcome an obstacle? You're faced with a problem. How do you, quote unquote, address it? Reverse engineer, pardon the pun there, interjecting some humor. Or how do you address those kind of things that inevitably show up? Well, it's kind of hard to have a a, a blanket uh, statement to cover that. It depends on the adversity. Whether I mean, the types of adversity I see is uh, it can be funding, it could be technology, it could be um, it could be uh, dealing with people, it could be COVID, it could be uh, supply chain issues. So I say the first thing to do is be calm. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, don't get hysterical. Uh, don't get, uh, set your emotions aside and t attack the problem analytically. Um, look for areas where you can get help. Uh, look for areas that you can take the task on yourself and solve the problem or when you have to go to someone else to help with the problem. So I would say that most problems are 
uh, are solvable if you can remain it, um, if you can keep a cool head. I love that. So to remove the emotions from the decision-making process, try to make rational, not emotional decisions, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. I would say one time without, um, I had, um, I got drafted uh, during a national emergency act in Canada and uh, I was pressed into service to fight fires. And uh, during some time off, I took a, a walk with, a, with some friends and um, I accidentally stepped into quicksand. Oh, wow. So my greatest sales pitch was get the person near me to enter to intervene and to a rescue right he wanted to run off and get help mm -hmm. by the time i would be under the quicksand right so I had to convince him in the most calmest of voice to come closer to the water with a long branch pass me the branch and uh, help pull myself out of the water wow Wow, wow, wow. That is fantastic. I love that story. How about the best piece of advice you'd like to share with the audience or give your 30-year-old self? On um, Okay, in terms of what not to do or to do in business? Anywhere you want to go. Okay. Um, I would say that um, a short list of things would be to say, look, um, don't take technology and search for an application. Focus on the application and find the best technology. I've too often seen good technology placed in inappropriate applications, which only led to short-term solutions. Um, to limit competition, I've seen engineers uh, intentionally increase the complexity of the invention in order to prevent it from being replicated elsewhere. I say to simplify the invention as much as you can and make the business model more complex by adding additional services. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. um, minimize the number and levels of outsourcing. Mm -hmm. Outsourcing means that you've got more partners sharing the profit. Outsourcing can be very convenient and very, very popular, but as time goes on, as the... Uh, as the world seems to shrink, it's harder and harder to pass on the extra cost of this outsourcing convenience to the customer. Now, there are certain tasks that are best outsourced at a lower cost uh, than performing in-house, where someone has a better technology in producing it, and he can uh, give you a lower cost to um, produce the part than you can in-house. But um have the ability to make an accurate make or buy decision and if the company if another company can produce the part elsewhere at a lower cost investigate why Ooh, and, that's really good yeah and, uh, again in terms of diversity uh keep diversity high in your product uh just don't sell one widget because one day that widget may not ne be needed um, diversify your markets because uh, your customer or your market may disappear. Mm -hmm. uh, diversify the applications within the markets and diversify your workforce. Mm -hmm. uh, having a diverse workforce is very important in today's world of increasing competition. Got it. Well, Arthur, this has been absolutely fantastic. Investors can learn more by going to polarpower.com and then clicking on the investor tab if they have uh, at the ticker symbols POLA. And Arthur, thank you so much. It's been fantastic. Hopefully we'll have you on again soon. Well, thanks for having me. And I look forward to the next time. Thank you.